Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. This will be a little bit interesting with the uh, wind. But we're going to make it work. It is the Holy Spirit. I'll give you your iPad back, Noel. All right, well, Cedarbrook, uh, it is so good to be with you. Like Kyle said, we have been, we're wrapping up a series called Need to Know Hebrew Words. Um, if we've not had a chance to meet, my name is Mitch. I'm one of the pastors here. Come up to me afterwards. I would love to just learn your name, hopefully see you around, and uh, go from there. But like I said, this, this, this series is not just cool because uh, it's been Hebrew words. That's, that's good in and of itself. Uh, but we have a rotation of teachers. So if you've been here over the last few weeks, you may know there's been other people who you would, might not recognize, Jamie Staples from Renew, uh, a few others, long list of people who've been able to share in these messages. Uh, but since this is the last week, I think it's pretty much guaranteed this will be the best one. Um, that's what Kyle said. He needed it to be the best one, and I guaranteed it would. Uh, I'm just joking. But in all seriousness, um, I've already preached this once at, at Renew, so I've been able to trim out any heresy, uh, any concerns that you might have here this morning. But this need to know, it's a really cool uh, Hebrew words. Not many of us are fluent in Hebrew, including myself. I know just enough to know that I want to know more, and hopefully you can take some of that away today. Uh, but understanding God's story, uh, I've had a privilege. My word today is going to be tov. Uh, T-O-V, how we would maybe, you've heard Mazel Tov, or at the T-O-V, and we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper. Maybe you're familiar with that, and maybe you're not, but uh, hopefully this morning we'll unpack its rich and beautiful meaning a little bit more. But like the tagline suggests, Hebrew's not our first language, and so for us to understand it more fully, and to understand maybe how God intended it, we should want, it should lead us to a desire to dig deeper, and hopefully, again, that's what you take away this morning. But it wasn't written in Hebrew, or it was, sorry, English. It wasn't written in English originally. New Testament was Greek and Old Testament uh, was Hebrew. And, and for us to dive deeper is can only add value. So let's buckle up. Today's message uh, is going to be all the way back to Genesis 1, uh, the beginning of the beginning, the genesis of the genesis. So you probably here have heard it said or read it yourself in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But today, I want to make sure we don't miss what I believe is a key component to the creation story. I think it's, a, it's easy to overlook this vital thing, and we get caught up in a lot of debate surrounding interpretation. Even in the very outset of Genesis, of, of whether there were seven literal days or a day actually represents an age. And maybe you wish I was doing a Hebrew lesson on the word for day. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to solve that debate for you this morning. Uh, I'm going to blow past all the debate, and we're just going to dive into what I believe the text uh, is calling us. God is calling us to now, here, and in, in this world, as well as he was in creation. So we're going to look at the text, but I'm going to give you a warning. If you're looking in a Bible or on a Bible app, I'm going to do like a Cliff Notes version. I'm going to skip through the scriptures pretty fast, so if I lose you, I apologize, but you'll understand why. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness night. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the first day. Let there be a space between the waters, and that is what happened. God called the space sky. Let the waters beneath the sky flow together in one place so dry ground may appear, and that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the water seas, and God saw that it was good. Let the land sprout with vegetation, and that is what happened, and God saw that it was good. You're kind of catching this rhythm that starts. Let light appear in the sky to separate the day from the night, and that is what happened, and God saw that it was good. Do I need to move forward or backwards? Where's Jackson? Well, there's a little bit of feedback. Backwards. Are you sure? Let's try that. How's that? All right, so the rhythm is there. Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind. Livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. That is what happened, and God saw that it was. Thank you. 
Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, and that is what happened. And then the last verse of chapter one, then God looked over all he had made and saw that it was very good, very good. So this phrase, and God saw that it was good, this phrase should cause us to pause, at least for a little bit. Good, in English, good. The creation of the whole world and everything in all of its intricacies was good. That I don't think our English translators had many adjectives to work with back then. Really, just good? How about great, wonderful, wondrous, awesome, majestic, rad, bodacious, super wicked awesome? But good? Good? I think it should make us question our own language, first of all. But sadly, many of us, we will skim right over it and not slow down, and we will take that at face value. A lot of us do that, myself included. Well, as long as God said it was good, it must be good. Or did I mean, did I miss something? Does good mean more than I think it means? Let's take a closer look. Have we failed to hold this word in the proper divine life-giving nature all right as i mentioned before the hebrew word we're going to study this morning is tov it doesn't roll off the tongue super well but tov the word tov is used in the hebrew text and it's the word we translate into good the common use so if you were to look at a hebrew text would have been and god said it was good it was elohim which would be a word for god a name for god elohim saw that it was tov now, the Hebrew authors also believed that God's name was so holy that it couldn't even be written down. They often wrote G hyphen D or some abbreviation of his name in English or Elohim, which is one of many names for God. But they felt unworthy to put into print God's name. That alone, that alone should tell us that this word good, we might be mistreating it or mishandling it. So why do we need a deeper understanding of God's creation? This is a good question for you this morning. What, how will that change your life? Why is tov a need-to-know word? Well, I believe there are at least three. I could go on a long, long list of significant life application, but I'm going to stick to three because I think there's three really low-hanging fruit that come from this. We'll walk through those. Number one, I think... One life application that can come out of this text is a more comprehensive view, a more full picture of the creation narrative. That's one. And which concludes in the devastation of the fall of humanity. And number two, a better understanding of the alignment between God, the creator, the father of the Old Testament, and Jesus, the New Testament, the son. There's an alignment between Old Testament and New Testament that I think is an important takeaway. As Jesus teaches on the flourishing of humanity and the depravity of humanity. And lastly, I hope you take away, there is a life-changing perspective that calls you and I into action today, here and now. So if you hear nothing about this like historical word search and you know word study, it should call us, both you and I, to something today. All right, first was that comprehensive view of creation. When researching Hebrew words, it's often said of tov, T-O-V, that it might be the smallest word with the biggest meaning. The smallest word with the biggest meaning in the whole Hebrew language. Now, I don't know how you can quantify that, but I tend to agree. For today's purpose, though, we're going to just focus on a couple key points. When we peel back the layers of this onion, we will find multiple levels of layer, texture, meaning. It's so easy to go down a certain line of thinking and, it, and to, to turn away, it took a 90-degree turn, and you realize, oh, I don't know if I should pursue that, but it's beautiful. It's really interesting. And then you'll go a little farther, and it turns the other way, and you could follow all kinds of tangents when you research any word. I think one of the most beautiful things that I realized in the study of this text was that if I was to follow all of those interrelated meanings, if I had to kind of back out to a bird's-eye view, it's really like this one word is creating a tapestry of how God has viewed and put his mark on the world. And it's just, it's literally too much to put into one message. This could be a series on Tove, but for today's purposes, we got to figure out how to whittle it down. Okay, so the layer one was just the translation, good. And I, we think that's, 
it's not satisfactory or our understanding of it is not. Layer two would be an understanding of how it's used in context. Now, God's creation was complete, might be another word for tov, or perfect, lacking nothing. The creator of everything created the whole world and said that it was good over and over. It almost has a rhythm to it. Then Genesis 1 concludes with that seal of or stamp of divine approval. It was very good. It was tov meod, very good. It's almost like the buildup of some of our favorite movies. Things were perfect, almost too perfect. So perfect, in fact, that God needed to take a rest. It was everything he created was absolutely perfect. And we know the rest of how Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 and really the rest of history goes for that matter. God creates God finds a partner for Adam and lays a couple of ground rules. And then by chapter 3, it is unraveling and has fallen apart completely. Now, this is a, I'm going to say this twice because I think it's really critical. The level of devastation that occurred in the fall, in Adam and Eve's sin, is directly proportionate or related to the divine perfection of God and what he created and what he handed them. I'm going to say this again. The level of devastation that was experienced when Adam and Eve sinned was directly related to the level of divine perfection that God had handed them when he created the world. You maybe have heard the quote, the depth of your pain is equal to the heights of your joy. Maybe you've heard that phrase somewhere. And I think the world of the field of psychology agrees, at least when it comes to emotional regulation. Some of you feel pretty regulated today and some of you are like, I am never emotionally regulated but there's this interesting thing. If you think of a sliding scale and your emotional state that is homeostasis or is good, is neutral, is zero. And all of the painful experiences you've experienced are the negative numbers to the left of this number line. Well, if you've experienced some hard things, it's very likely that you can experience some amazing joy in your life because you've faced the, the hard things or because vice versa, you've had hard things in your life. So you understand what I'm saying. For us to fully understand the fracture of what happened when Adam and Eve choice uh, they're ch choosing to sin is to fully appreciate the magnitude of perfection of creation that was lost. So that's one layer deeper. It just, it just can keep going deeper. Now, that second life application thing we mentioned earlier. From our study of Tov and its use outside of Genesis 1, some might recall a story. I'm going to tell a short story about Solomon in 1 Kings 3. Maybe you've read this text, and if you have not, please. <laughs> Spend some time this afternoon, First, First Kings 3. There's a story where two prostitutes, and he's trying to settle a dispute between two prostitutes. Each of them had a, had a son uh, about three days apart, and one of the mothers accidentally rolled over their infant son and suffocated it. It died. Now, there was some malfeasance, some um, deception, because in the night, one of the mothers switched the dead baby for the living baby. And suddenly, the mother wakes up and says, this is not my baby. Anyways, they go to Solomon to settle this dispute. Solomon says, <coughs> I shouldn't laugh because it's not funny. <laughs> As they argued for it, Solomon's decision was to get out a sword and cut the baby in half. What? What? That's Solomon's decision, cut the baby in half and give each half of the living child to each mother. At his conclusion, the one mother said, please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Do not kill him. And the second mother said, neither I nor you shall have him cut him in two. This really dark analogy or story, this process revealed who the true mother was. And so Solomon gives her parental rights. What in the world is going on in this text? This is like, it seems almost unrelated until we back up a few verses. God appeared to Solomon in a dream and told Solomon that he could ask for anything that he wanted and God would give it to him. Must be nice. Solomon's response was that he wanted to be given a discerning heart, one that could distinguish. Well, the verse reads like this. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Other translations to say, they say discern between good and evil. Or in Hebrew, in, to discern between tov and rav, 
good and evil. Again, in Genesis 15, the story of Joseph, we read that Joseph's brothers are afraid of what Joseph might do to them after he had treated him so badly. They basically forged a note from their dead father and told Joseph that if these were their father's last wishes, to forgive his brothers. It goes like this. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Uh, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Verse 20 again said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Tov. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Last part of this section, if, you, if we take this to the New Testament, where Jesus, we read where Jesus in Mark 10 is delivering some really crushing news to this guy. He says, the man, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell to his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, why do you call me good teacher? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love that phrase. He looked at him and loved him. And he says, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, then, come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So the reason this story becomes relevant in this Tove conversation is Jesus was clearly moral. Jesus was good, if we're talking about a moral application. So the use of good doesn't seem, to, it doesn't seem that simple. It means perfect or complete. Jesus was living a perfect life, but it wasn't fulfilled. It wasn't complete yet. Not everything had been finished. Just like the man in, the co in these commandments, he kept them all, but something was missing, and Jesus pointed it out. When Jesus put his finger on what was missing, the guy melted. He knew. He knew. Last reference is Romans 3. Paul talks about, he quotes David, he quotes Solomon. I'm going to paraphrase it all. It's super simple. No one is righteous. No one is good. Everyone is sinful. Paul and Jesus are creating this. There's an exclusionary or exclusive connotation to this word good, this word tov, that only God is perfect. Only God is complete. Only God could have created something so perfect and was lacking nothing. All right, we're at the last, the home stretch. This third life application. Third life application is that something that calls us into action. Hopefully it is a life-changing perspective for you. We have to go back to the creation passage from the beginning and slow it down even more to catch something. So a refresher, God saw that light was tov. All the things that he created were tov. In Genesis 2, it says that w one of the two trees in the center of the garden was the tree of knowledge of good and evil or the, no the knowledge of tov and rob. But if we look at day three of creation, something jumps out that I really want you to take home. This is how we want to land this plane. <laughs> Verse 11. Then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. You're probably wondering, why is he talking about the vegetables? Let the land produce vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. This is important. Their seeds produce plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. So God creates life with the ability to give more life. God could have created beautiful trees and beautiful fruit with seedless, seedless watermelons. They taste great, but they don't make more watermelons out of those watermelons. So in human beings, God created you and I with this ability, this capacity to bring forth more life, not just biologically, not just reproductively, but spiritually, emotionally. Think about the potential you and I have with the words that come out of our mouth. I have the, the ability to hurt you. 
or to heal you. I have the ability to bring life and I have the ability to bring death with what I speak. I can offer all of those things. I can think life. I can think death. Tov is so, so much more than God patting himself on the back saying, job well done, saw that it was good. It's not about God needing to praise himself. He saw that it would be life-producing. He saw that it would be meaningful, exponentially meaningful. Tov is about flourishing, human flourishing in particular, which is at the heart of ever, why God created everything in the beginning. Here's where everything comes back into one stream. Everything that God created was complete, not good. Or sorry, it was good, not evil. Perfect, not lacking. But it was also, here's the phrase, life-giving. You and I are called to live in this tension of bringing life into this world. Solomon, his gift of discernment was to preserve or bring about life, even in his judgment. Jesus says that no one is complete but God. Paul references David and Solomon. It's, they're all pointing to how deeply this world was broken. So this tension exists between good and evil, light and dark, life and death. Tov, tov, tov is at the heart. I believe it's at the heart of God's will. His intention and call upon us, you and I, to live into it. I'm going to leave you with this passage. There's the last phrase in this block of text. It's out of John 15. I appreciate you being patient. I can, I can so easily be long-winded, so <laughs> if you're burning in the sun, I apologize. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Solomon reference. This is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you, I have told you that this, that, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and you may be in your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Here it is. Here's the here's the takeaway. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Dear friends, you are my friends. I need each and each and every one of you to hear this. Not only were you and I created within a world that was once Tov, it was once perfect and complete. You and I were created with the ability to choose and with the ability to give life and death in the things we say, things we think, and the things we do. Jesus not only gave his life for us sacrificially, he died for us. He not only gave it for us, but he gives life to us. He gives us the ability to bring about more life. Yes, this world is deeply broken, but we are called to abide in Christ who offers us his life. His resurrection allows us to plant seeds in people's lives to bring about more growth and more flourishing and to bring about tov in this world. Last, Genesis 2. I, I think, was it Kyle who spoke on ruah? I think so. Ruah was another word about God's spirit, God's breath. And in Genesis 2, right in the creation passage, God breathed life into us, which was his spirit. And by his spirit, we are called to breathe life into the relationships around us. I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, you created the most indescribable world for us to live in. We don't give you near enough credit. Thank you for loving us so much that you allowed us to be in relationship with you. We want to grieve the places where we've contributed to brokenness, darkness. We've even contributed to death without knowing it. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord. But God, you offer us new life through your son, Jesus. He demonstrated the greatest act of love for us when he gave us his life so that we could be free.
Thank you for that gift, God. We ask that you would open our eyes to the richness of Tov. Not just its definition, but its deep meaning purpose and ultimate application, Lord. May we speak life into our relationships. May we honor you with our actions, our thoughts, and our mouths. Help us to be as wise as Solomon and to always seek restoration, reconciliation, and redemption. You offer us life, God, so that we can offer it to each other. Thank you for loving us first. In your name we pray. Amen.